I'm Samuel Zwickel. I'm Andrew Liang. And we're roommates at Harvard. Andrew, hurry up! Sam, get out of here! Right now, we don't amount to much. So we decided to see what interesting things other pairs of friends have done since leaving Cambridge. Turns out some Crimson editors teamed up to help a president win re-election. Other friends run multi-billion dollar hedge funds together. So join us as we chat with these people who are much cooler than we are. And this is Crimson, Crimson Connections. Connections. So how did, um, how did you all meet at Harvard and, and what were your sort of first impressions of each other? For what it's worth, I didn't grow up in America. I was a foreign student and I arrived on the campus um, in the fall of 1989. And I don't think I met Mary Louise until Elliott House. This is the day of pre-iPhone, pre-everything. And so um, life on campus was very different uh, than what I imagine you guys experiencing right now. But in terms of meeting Mary Louise, it was like this we were on campus for starters, and when you, by the way, when you make a plan with your friends, we're going to meet at the union for dinner, you stick with your plans because you don't have, you can't text in the middle of the day and say, hey, let's change plans, right? So it's a very different world. Um, but uh, meeting Mary Louise, I remember, I mean, I I'm like coming out of my shell now as an adult, but like I was, I was like semi shy, maybe a little bit freshman year. Um, and I remember meeting Mary Louise in the Elliot House. I'm like, this is a blonde fireball. So much energy and passion and just full of um, goodness, even back in the day. That's, that's, I think, encapsulates my earliest memory. Huh. Um, yeah, so I, like Tracy, arrived freshman year, fall of 1989. Um, I grew up in the States, but was born in Germany. And, you know, one of my big memories of arriving was the fall of the Berlin Wall and watching that, you know, all crowded around this one little TV screen where we're having to bang it because we didn't get great reception, um, you know, with adjust the antenna everywhere. Um, and I guess I mentioned that because I grew up in Georgia, in Atlanta, in a, a lovely school. I went to the same school from kindergarten through 12th grade, all the same kids. It was pretty homogenous. Almost everyone was white. Almost everybody's parents voted Republican. And I got to Harvard and it was like mind blown um, in such a great way, but I felt a little bit like this yokel arriving on the global stage. And in Waltz is somebody like Tracy, who is so glamorous and just landed from Hong Kong and, you know, chatting in one language on this ear and chatting in another language here. And it was just like, okay, wow. Like, I'm now, this is, it felt like the big leagues, you know, that feeling? It felt like here I am, like competing with the best and brightest and getting to hang out with these people who have seen things and done things that I can't even imagine. And we now consider each other honorary roommates because our, our rooming groups have become. Should we, fair, should we share the acronym or is it too much? We are FONS, F-O-N-S, <laughs> which explain. <laughs> It's, um, I think, a dozen or so of us that we've just kept in touch over the years. We get together, you know, pre-COVID, maybe once or twice a year. It's usually a sleepover. We would meet in a city in the middle of the country or we would gather in one of our houses. And it's a diverse group. It's uh, a couple We of were in Chicago at this exact time last year, although I don't think you made that one. I didn't make it. Nope. But the fawns continue. I, by the way, I, another significant memory, be, the Elliott House Dining Hall. I met my husband in the Elliott House yeah. Dining Hall. He was two years ahead of um, Mary Louise and me. He was class of 91, and um, he was also an economics major. The reason I said that I actually completed my thesis is because Leon um, just kept me going. Uh, <laughs> maybe in some places helped me run some regressions. Uh, thank you. No, no, thank you for places on campus. Um, 14 Plimpton Street is very special to us as editors on The Crimson. Um, and, and Mary Louise, you got your journalistic start there. Would you mind sharing a bit about what that experience was like? Yeah, it was something I knew I wanted to do. I'd edited my high school paper. 
I didn't know any more than any freshman, or, or certainly 99% of freshmen know exactly what you're going to do with your life, um, but it seemed like a pretty strong contender because, uh, you know, I'd already seen just editing my high school paper. You can make a difference. You can get the rules changed. I did this hard-hitting interview, you know, my senior year of, of high school with um, our assistant principal over uniform code and why he was unfairly and overly strictly enforcing it. And they backed down and changed the rules. And I was like, oh my God, like, that's not, that's not, you know, me, Mary Louise Kelly. I mean, he just couldn't care less what I think about the rules, but he cares because it was front page of the paper and it, you know, sparked a student assembly and like, I can actually change things. So I knew that was something I wanted to do. I loved the Crimson, just the the building, you know, uh, the it, having that home and space and just really tight, tight group from the beginning in a campus that can be kind of overwhelming um, with, you know, seriously sophisticated people like Tracy, you know, running around that felt like, okay, these, this is my tribe. These are my people. Like I can, you know, I get, I get the way that we're thinking about this and I know how to do a story. So, so you all, like Mary Louise, you're on the Crimson staff, and Tracy, you meet your husband, and, and Elliot, and you're, you're an act concentrator. So where do you go after graduation? You know, I, I was pretty sure I wanted to be a journalist, but I did look at other things. I had, I'll just tell really briefly, this one pivotal, pivotal day. Uh, you know, I was in England, and so was applying for jobs there and back in the States, and I had... Um, on the same day, back-to-back -back interviews in London, one at McKinsey to go be a management consultant. Um, and it was, I think this was second or third round because they'd come to campus and then this was like, you know, come to the office and see how this could all be yours. And I do remember thinking like, this is really nice. They had really nice offices right on Piccadilly <laughs> Circus and the starting salary is then was probably more than I make now. And I would have like a secretary and... I thought I could, you know, I could do this. Um, you know, eh, I could do this. Um, and, you know, plenty of great people have fabulous careers doing that. More power to them. But I finished that, grabbed a sandwich, and then went to the BBC um, and had an interview there. And uh, they kept me waiting for more than two hours because there was some huge story breaking in the Middle East that day and the whole newsroom is going bananas and, you know, editors are running around and everybody's screaming and the studio doors are slamming. And I just sat there and had, you know, every once in a while in your life, you have one of these moments where you know what the right thing is to do. <laughs> And you should listen to them um, because I sat there and thought, oh, my God, like I am home. <laughs> I'm home. These are my people. And they're offering, you know, a fraction of the salary that McKenzie was. And I will never have a secretary, <laughs> I'm like, you know, but oh, my God, I'm so happy I would pay you to just keep sitting here. Um, and I took a job with the BBC. And that was for me kind of the real, real beginning. Well, I'm, I'm far less intentional. I was all over the place. So in college, I, you know, worked at, I, one summer I worked in Puerto Rico. One summer I worked at Harvard Student Agencies. One summer I worked for Procter & Gamble in Singapore. Those were my three academic summers. And then, you know, my extracurriculars were also all over the place. I, uh, my, our roommates and I ran the Elliott House Grill. That was our first. Oh yeah, that and was so great. Like French fries and hamburgers every night before we went to bed. It was um, definitely um, a memorable experience and smelly experience. Um, I produced musicals. I mean, I was really all over the place, but I was think I was obsessed with another challenge, which was at this point I um, had decided that I wanted to make a life in this country, and um, I decided to. Um, you know, not go back home to Hong Kong. Uh, it, it, it was, yes, I met the boy and, and that factored into the decision, but it was also because um, the values of this country, um, you know, really resonated with me. And I, I just really wanted to stay here and make a life. So um, so what did I do? You, you go for the big companies who would sponsor you to get a H-1B visa. And um, and because I am, again, a dutiful Chinese daughter, you know, you kind of go for the more predictable options. So I was that person that worked at McKinsey's New York office right after college. 
uh, did that for two years. And then what's the, you know, um, likely next step? You go back to business school or law school or whatever school. So that's what I did right afterwards. And by that time I was married, we decided to live in Boston. Leon was in medical school and I needed to um, find a job in Boston. So I worked in asset management at Wellington Management Company after business school. And then I went back into consulting where I spent almost 12 years. And unlike Mary Louise, who followed her heart, you know, kind of found purpose in her professional life, I was like always just kind of like doing the next thing I was supposed to do. And you were getting the experience like, to follow your heart, which you've now done. So 10 years ago, I broke from the path and it's really been an extraordinary 10 years. So, um, after many years of being kind of on track, if you will, um, I started an impact investing nonprofit uh, with two remarkable human beings, Ronald Cohen and David Blood. And it, I mean, for the first time in my professional life, it wasn't like, you don't go to work to go to work. Like, you know, my grandfather used to say, if you love your job, you never have to work a day in your life. I mean, that is how I have felt in the last 10 years. And this you know, consilience of, you know, personal values and, and professional um, undertaking. And, and it's just felt really, really great. So, yeah, I feel very lucky. I guess this is right around 2003, beginning, you know, run up to the Iraq war. And I just had a, another little like listen to it moment, but um, sitting in a State Department briefing and thinking, I think there's a lot of foreign policy going on that is not being run through the State Department. It's pulsing through covert channels, um, through the intelligence agencies and through parts of the Pentagon. And that would be really fascinating to try to figure out how that works. Um, so I made the case and they let me launch the beat. And it was truly terrifying. I mean, I have also worked as Pentagon correspondent and, you know, Pentagon correspondent, you, you, I mean, everything's a little different right now in COVID era, um, but you, you get a hard pass to the building and you can go and wander around the Pentagon. And if there's some general who's not returning your call, you can go like lurk outside the men's room across from his office and like bump into him. Um, and when the <laughs> defense secretary travels, reporters are on the plane and they hold daily press briefings and tell you what they're doing. I mean, not everything, obviously, your job is to figure out all the things they're not telling you, but um you have a you have a, a starting point <laughs> there's some kind of in you go try to cover the cia or the national security agency and um needless to say you can't just wander in and wander around um needless to say they don't tell you when the director of the cia is going to travel and um you certainly wouldn't be invited on the plane <laughs> if you happen to figure it out. Um, and there's no directory and they never hold a press briefing. And like, how the heck are you supposed to find out what's happening? Um, so that was a huge, huge learning curve. Um, really learning how to work sources. Um, really building those relationships over years and years and years. Um I know I this week, this past week, interviewed uh, John Burnham again, the former director of the CIA under Obama. Um, and I have interviewed him many times now going back, oh, I don't know, 15 years. Um, wow. And you build that relationship. You're still working a source. I mean, he's not my friend. I don't go to dinner at his house. Um, but there's a, a level of trust that develops. Um where you are, you know, trying to, you're feeling around like for crumbs in the dark all the time. And it's, it's, um, it is the most fascinating, the most challenging, frustrating beat, but there's, there's just nothing else like it. And I still, now that I've transitioned to you know, anchoring a, a evening news show where it's, I mean, this show that I anchor is called All Things Considered, and we consider all the things. So I might be doing sports or economics or, you know, politics or arts, or it could be anything on any given day. Um, but, you know, obviously we're all human and we all have things that we're interested in, and I tend to grab all of the national security foreign policy interviews for myself, um, or at least as many as, as they'll let me get away with. Tracy, um, what is so special about you know social impact investing and what made you transition and, and sort of dedicate your life after management consulting and, and everything else to that 
I think it's one of these ideas whose time has come and, and it cannot be stopped. Um, we have big problems in the world and this, you know, bifurcated worldview that you should rely on government and philanthropy to address problems in the world um, and that the business community or Wall Street has nothing to do with it. I mean, it's like it just doesn't work anymore. So, um, you know, you've heard about the ESG movement, the environmental social governance movement, mostly in the, you know, public markets on the equity side and the fixed income side. And then increasingly, there is a very exciting movement uh, called impact investing, which is closer to the private markets. Um, you know, a lot of private equity firms, venture firms are starting impact investing funds. And the way we approach it at Social Finance, just we just take the definition of impact, the measurement of impact, and the um, ongoing measurement of impact just um, so seriously that we take it to the whole new level, such that, you know, when we launch a social impact bond, which is a tool to um, uh, make government resources more effective and more outcomes oriented, or a new strategy called Career Impact Bond, which is all about worker upskilling and, and retraining, and particularly right now with folks who are displaced from COVID. Every single dollar of invest investment returned back to the investor means that someone's life has actually improved, whether they have, they're experiencing wage mobility and going up the economic ladder, or whether it's a person who lived um, left the criminal justice system and is gainfully employed in their community, or whether it's universal pre-K, but actually hitting the reading level outcomes that we seek. Um, so that tight linkage of actually measurable impact um, and investor expectations and actual returns, it, it, we just kind of take that impact integrity to a whole new level. And um, there's just never been a more exciting time to do this work because I feel like um, it's just very much the zeitgeist now and, and there's a lot of wind in our sails, but still it, it needs to get to scale so that we can help you know millions of people, not you know tens and thousands of people. So I'm encouraged with the momentum. That's great. And Mary Louise, your last question was something I think a lot of people, especially on the Crimson heard about, um, was your sort of more recent interview with Mike Pompeo. And we wanted to ask sort of of your take on that and also what exactly happened there and really whether you were able to, to identify uh, Ukraine on a map. Yeah. Um, so that was, I had been asking for an interview with Mike Pompeo for a while. Um, I got an email while I was in Tehran reporting in January of this year that, yes, we've got a date. Here's the date and time. Come to the State Department. He's the Secretary of State. There's a gazillion things you could ask him, but they had said you've got 10 minutes. Um, and so I always, uh, you know, try to go in basically with just a couple of questions to ask. I mean, I had, you know, the, the, all of my questions were on a piece of paper this big um, because you know you're going to ask it. They're not going to totally answer it. They're going to dodge. And so you're thinking, okay, now I'm going to have to push back and follow up and follow up and follow up and keep finding ways to ask this to try to elicit some information. Um, so I went in with kind of two questions. One was, uh, you know, Iran, like, what's the end game? <laughs> yeah, you, you know, you, you, we don't, you're saying the U.S. does not want Iran to get nuclear weapons. How are you going to stop them? Like, what's next? What's the end game? Um, and we spent the bulk of the interview on that. I also really felt we were at the time in the middle of, uh, you know, the Senate impeachment and trial. Uh, the president of the United States centered around Ukraine, which is firmly in the secretary's portfolio. Um, and there were questions which, to my surprise, when I went back and really looked, he had not been asked um, about Ukraine policy. Um, he does a fair number of interviews, but he tends to do them with friendly news sources or with local news. Um, and I just kept looking and thinking, has he really never been asked about Ambassador Marie Ivanovich? Has he really never been asked about Ukraine policy and whether the shadow foreign policy was being conducted, which was separate from what the official U.S. State Department policy was? Has really nobody ever asked? Um, so we set up the interview. Uh, you always have some conversations back and forth uh, with the staff beforehand. And in that case, um, they were, you know, saying, we really hope you're going to focus on Iran. And I, you know, uh, this is exchange of emails and wrote back and said, definitely going to focus on Iran, um, but I never take anything off the table. I'm also going to ask about Ukraine. And 
we'll see what the news gods serve up overnight. Because the second you take anything off the table, you know, war will break out in the Middle East or Vladimir Putin will invade some other country. You know, something will happen that you really need to ask the secretary about. The interview was tense pretty much from the beginning. Um, and got really tense when I asked about Ukraine, which, uh, as he said during the interview, said, I, I agreed to come talk to you about Iran. And I said, well, I told your staff last night I'm going to ask about Ukraine, and we're talking Ukraine, so let me ask the question again. Um, and it got very tense. Uh, we finished. They cut a, sh a little bit short of 10 minutes because he was done. <laughs> um, and his staff stood up and said, we're done. I thanked him. Um, he leaned over and just glowered at me, um, said nothing, and left. Um, so we're packing up and we're about to leave, and he had made news in that interview. Uh, so we were going to go down and file it. And one of the aides, one of his press team, came back out. The double doors opened again to his suite of offices, and she said, You, just you, don't bring your recorder with me. So the rest of my team is left out there. I go back into his private, he's got a private living room back there. Uh, and he uh, yelled for about 10 minutes. He was really mad. Um, he used the F word repeatedly and asked, do you think people fucking care about, do you think Americans care about fucking Ukraine? And I said, I, I, I think, they do, but it doesn't matter what I think. You're the Secretary of State. <laughs> these are these are questions that are totally within your portfolio. They're fair questions. He said, you couldn't even find Ukraine on a map. And I said, well, I could, but again, that's not the point. Was there a specific question you're upset over here? Uh, and he called out to aides sitting outside and said, bring me a blank map of the world. So they did. Um, you know, like... 9 by 11, I think, might have been lead, might have been legal size, I can't remember, but, you know, standard size piece of paper, not a big map. Um, and not only no writing, but no, you know, no um, borders marked, nothing, just land masses. Um, and he said, point to Ukraine, and you, you know, I have, I have a degree, you know, my master's is in European studies, I have been to Russia, I have just been covering, <laughs> again, like, the whole the phone call about Ukraine and an impeachment saga centered around Ukraine. I know where Ukraine is, and you're looking at the map thinking it's there. But, you know, on a map like that, the Black Sea is, like, that big. Um, Crimea is, like, you know, a, a speck. Um, I pointed at it. He put the map away. He yelled at me for a little bit longer. Said people will hear about this. And I thanked him again, and I left. Um... And then, you know, it was the first time, it was the first time I have ever in the United States had occasion to worry about the tape. Are they going to let this tape out of the building? Um, and I was relieved when we left the inner sanctum and went back to the kind of reception areas that my producer was gone. She had gone down to the booth and she was filing to get that tape out of our recorder, out of the building, back to the mothership. This was on the record. You know, I was there at the State Department to interview him. It was not on tape, but... There was never an agreement to go off the record. Um, that's why I was there. And this is of public interest. You know, this is a person running the United States of America's foreign policy. Um, and this speaks to character and it speaks to motive and it speaks to how he views the world. And we need to get this out there. So we did. We called and told him, uh, we're planning to use that portion of the interview. Do you all have anything you want to say? Um... And, uh, you know, we got the answer the following morning when on State Department letterhead, he released a statement uh, calling me a liar and saying that I had pointed to Bangladesh or suggesting that I had pointed to Bangladesh, which um, you can look at any map you want to look at. They are on different continents. <laughs> so there we are. Uh, it was a learning experience. Um, which I wrote about for the New York Times and others. Um, I did not talk about it, uh, declined all the interview requests. I just wanted to let the interview and the journalism stand for themselves um, and let people make up their mind as they wanted to, as what they wanted to think of it. And that was, that might be, you know, we, we aired the whole thing. Usually you would clean up for coughs and 
ums and ahs and you know tighten a little bit and in that case I said to my producer I don't I, like not a single edit this airs exactly as we taped it so that there is zero question that anything was edited manipulated in any way people will experience the entire <laughs> interview as I did and we aired it and yeah here we are